Yeah, welcome to this uh, podcast. I am delighted to be joined by Professor Heinz D. Cruz, who is uh, currently Professor of Economics at the University of Graz since the year 1988. Professor Cruz has held appointments for teaching at University of Bremen in Germany, University of Kiel in Germany, the New School for Social Research in New York, among others. Professor is also the director of the Graz Schumpeter Center since the year 2006. Professor Kurz has published numerous papers in journals, including Australian Economic Papers, Bulletin of Economic Research, Cambridge Journal of Economics, Economica, Economic Systems Research, European Journal of the History of Economic Thought, European Journal of Political Economy, History of Political Economy, among others. Professor Kuz has published several books with major foreign publishers, including Cambridge University Press, Basel Blackwell, Polity Press, Routledge, and Edward Alger. Professor's main book was co-authored with Neri Salvadori and is titled Theory of Production, a Long Period Analysis, and it was published in the year 1995 by Cambridge University Press. The Russian translation of this book was published in the year 2004, and a Chinese translation is in preparation, uh, which I believe has already been published. Professor is also the managing editor of Metronomica since the year 1998. Professor is also the co-founder and managing editor of the European Journal of the History of Economic Thought since its foundation in the year 1993. Professor's book, Economic Thought, A Brief History, has been translated into several languages, including Chinese, Spanish, Turkish, and Russian. And the Indian edition for this book is also available, and I will share the link in my description section. Yeah, welcome to this uh, podcast, Professor. Thank you very much. Um, I, I look forward uh, to your questions, um, and it's a pleasure to be with you uh, dealing with uh, a topic which I consider to be uh, very interesting and also very important. Yeah, yeah. thank you, sir, for you know doing this, uh, uh, Professor. So I asked my first question, which is uh, about your upbringing, uh, Professor. And I would like you to throw some light on your childhood days as you were growing up. So what was the motivation to obtain a diploma in economics from the University of Munich? And then, Professor, what was the motivation, again, to obtain your PhD in economics from University of Kiel? And uh, in answering this question, uh, sir, uh, if you could talk about any professor or an economist that, you know, left an uh, impression on you as you began your uh, professional career. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, well, uh, why did I study economics in the first place? I think one of the main reasons was I was intrigued by the question of how does this world function? And since uh, the economic sphere is of such a, an importance, um, I thought um, I better ought to study uh, this sphere uh, and to study economics. Now, Clearly enough, there was also a, a normative uh, thrive behind my decision. That is to say, um, I thought the world is interesting, but it might be better. And perhaps economics is a subject that would help to improve the world and improve the living conditions of uh, large numbers of people. Uh, as you know, and I don't have to tell you this, mm -hmm. um, Still nowadays, large parts uh, of the world population live in misery and um, there is hunger, there is uh, um, uh, illiteracy, there, is, uh, there are many, many evils. And I thought perhaps this subject would help me to understand better and upon understanding better, improve uh, the situation. Of course, that is a grandiose uh, motivation, but I think that played, played an important role in my in my own um, career. As regards uh, the PhD thesis, it just continued my um, previous uh, interests, uh, but now it was more, fo more focused because I had uh, arrived at the conclusion mm -hmm. that very often we can learn from earlier authors 
in particular, authors of the classical economic tradition, Adam Smith, David Ricardo, but yeah. then also Marx, and in modern times, Keynes, more than from the latest contributions to economics. So I thought the history of economic analysis is uh, of great importance, and I indeed um, did my PhD thesis on someone who, in my view, revived indeed the classical heritage, and that was Piero Zraffa, the economist who was brought to Cambridge uh, by John Maynard Keynes, and who published in 1960 his book, uh, Production of Commodities by Means of Commodities. I think he was indeed uh, that professor, that economist, that had the greatest impact on me and on my thinking. Okay. Okay. So, sir, I think of growing up, you know, Europe was just coming out of the Second World War, I think 50s, right? So, was that also like played a role in, in your, you know, the way you thought about economic issues? Well, I think it, it played a role in the sense that uh, you could see that, for example, the Nazi regime had uh, led Germany uh, decidedly on the wrong track. Uh, uh, I mean, all this nationalism, all this uh, uh, hate against uh, minorities, etc., mm -hmm. uh, ended up in disaster. And clearly enough, uh, the question was again whether economic thinking, which is very much about uh, the relationship between people, uh, how they um, deal with one another, how they communicate, uh, how they cooperate, uh, and also how they compete, whether this could help perhaps to avoid such uh, terrible derailments in, in the history of mankind. Yes, it played an important role, I think. Okay, so, sir, since you are an economic uh, historian, and uh, you have actually you know, traced the history of economic thought since its inception. So, sir, in your view, why, why don't you talk about as to what should be the aim of history of economic thought? And so whether the aim should either be light or fruit or somewhere in between, uh, Professor, yes. Well, um, I was not a, a, an economic historian or historian of economic thought, more precisely, from the beginning. But uh, when I studied economics and went back to uh, the sources of our subject mm -hmm. in the uh, 17th, 18th century, mm -hmm. I found that apparently the subject was of such a complexity mm -hmm. that... Um, um, several ideas of earlier authors did not make it into modernity because uh, they turned out to be uh, untractable. Uh, that is to say, economics is a subject which is characterized by authors, by economists, with uh, occasionally very sophisticated concepts and ideas, mm -hmm. but uh, a lack of tools to bring that uh, those concepts to full fruition. Therefore, one cannot expect that all that is good in past authors will be preserved and developed in later authors. You might as well have uh, a situation where some of the knowledge of the past got lost mm -hmm. because it turned out to be not capable of treating with our uh, tools, with our technologies. So I, I felt that uh, economics is not, uh, so to speak, a subject which knows only progress, progress, and nothing but progress, but it also has periods in time in which there is regress, in which certain concepts uh, are, are lost, are forgotten, uh, fall into oblivion, whereas others um, are becoming important, and it takes occasionally a very, very long time until, I mean, the faults, so to speak, um, and the errors made uh, on that path become apparent and changes are, are carried out. So, um, in short, uh, the history of economic thought uh, um, leads you to taking into account a treasure trove of ideas many of which have not become um, uh, suitable to modern economic thinking, but are important and ought to be taken into account. 
Yes, sir. So in fact, in the the paper that you have written, which is titled "Whether the History of Economic Thought uh, Going Nowhere Rather Slowly," you actually make this observation in the introduction section of the paper, where you talk about you know attending meetings where the trajectory is like you know they've actually gone in the opposite direction, right? So, so sir, why, according to you, has the profession and most of the contemporary economists you know, gone down in that direction. And uh, so what can be done in order to resurrect, uh, you know, this uh, professor? And uh, well, any relevant stakeholders, you know, that can take a lead in order to achieve this outcome, which is like, which is that, you know, most of the history of economic thought, like theories, which are actually important, but have not been given their due, you know, like, uh, share, you know, they also come to the forefront. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Well, I think uh, the question you asked earlier on, uh, and which is uh, being dealt with in the paper of mine you referred to, yeah. namely, um, what is the subject uh, to bring about, light or fruit? Yeah. Um, that's, that's a famous, uh, famous uh, um, question asked by earlier authors, Fritz Machlup and uh, and others, yeah. and uh, I think the answer is obvious. I mean, both light and fruit. I mean, as I mentioned, my motivation to study economics was essentially uh, fruit uh, changed the world for the better. Now, uh, if you have that in mind, I mean, you have to um, learn tools and uh, find approaches that are indeed suitable for that task. Uh, now, clearly enough, um, uh, bearing fruit uh, involves, at first, light. You must understand, you must see the mechanisms that are at work in, in the society under consideration, and whether institutionally um, and so on and so forth, these can be improved. So it is both light and fruit. Now, um, I think... Um, as regards my own uh, uh, approach to these things and the question you, you raised, why I think, I mean, certain avenues that have been taken by the profession, yeah. at least in large parts of the profession, yes. went perhaps into the wrong direction. I mean, that is uh, not easy to, to explain, but I think the elements that played a role are the following. First of all, I think, I mean, you see people when they start uh, doing economics or any of the social sciences, mm -hmm. they're typically driven by some kind of ideological predisposition. You know what I mean? I mean, you yeah. do not uh, start a subject yeah. without having some ideas in mind. A Schumpeter, uh, Josef Schumpeter, the famous Austrian yeah. economist, evolutionary economist in particular, pointed out, I mean, at the beginning of one's studies, there is always some kind of preconception of uh, some ideological um, view. Now, clearly enough, as you go on, this ideological view ought to be tested, ought to be put uh, to scrutiny. And mm -hmm. if that is done, uh, you might find out that your preconception was wrong and you have to correct it. But very often, I mean, and this is also the case in economics, um, you see people just trying to confirm desperately their prima vista, their first view of matters, and yeah. then you down the wrong alley. This is, this is possible. And it has happened many times, the same in sociology, in the political sciences, and so on and so forth. So, that is one aspect. I mean, you may have um, certain views at the beginning and you just uh, desperately try to stick to them, not change them, because that would, by some people, even considered a defeat. And this has to do with, I would put it that way, with a, a tendency towards a positive methodology. Show me your model. What can you do with it? Rather than what are the arguments you can put forward against certain views of the world 
from an economic point yes. of view, yes. that are wrong, a negative methodology. Yeah. And my feeling would be, since we will never ever succeed in getting a full picture uh, of, of the world in which we live, full truth, so to speak, yeah. it is a great, a great achievement if you're able to show that certain views cannot be uh, sustained for very good reasons. So eliminating what is wrong is, I think, at least, or is as important as putting forward what, what is right, because what is right is not so easy. What is wrong can often more easily be said. Absolutely. So, so, so this continuing with this Arthur Pegu actually has a quote, I will not read out the full quote, but in the last line he said, it is the promise of fruit and not of life, light that chiefly merits our regard. So, sir, um, if I can ask you this, so what, who are the relevant stakeholders here that can, like if they can do anything, what is it that they can do to, you know, to, you know, to undo this, to undo, you know, what has been done, uh, Professor? Well, I think um, if you look at the recent past, um, what we observed, were huge crises. I mean, think of the financial crisis in 2008. Yes. And in the following years, and the recurrent financial crisis, the breakdown of the banking system yeah. and all that. Now, um, read Adam Smith, 1776, The Wealth of Nations. Mm -hmm. He had already gone through a period of basic uh, bank crisis, and he had pu put forward an argument which said very clearly, this sector is crisis prone. Therefore, you must try to regulate it in a way which um, uh, makes the probability of such crisis uh, much lower than it currently is. So Smith knew all this. He's, he spoke about uh, herd behavior and contagion. He spoke about asymmetric information and so on and so forth. If that message had been taken up by the profession uh -huh. we could have had, we could have uh, had uh, could have avoided at least the uh, seriousness of the crisis so what i'm going to say i mean the history of economic thought has chapters which have never been fully explored and developed and if they had been things would be less uh, less bad. So in, in short, um, the stakeholders should be the economists themselves. They should care for the legacy of their subject. And in particular, those chapters that had not yet been fully developed and further elaborated. So sir, what you're saying is there are concepts which have not been explored because, because the real world problem has somehow not been able to you know, get get us to those concepts, right? Because you need problem in the real world to be able to understand that from the lens of economic uh, history. Is that correct, sir? Uh, yes, I think so. I mean, basically, I mean, let me just uh, get to one concept that is very famous, also coming from Adam Smith, the invisible hand, right? Okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure you have heard about it, for sure. Yeah. And what does it say, according to a... a, a a widespread interpretation. It says that selfish behavior, yeah, self-regarding behavior, which is yeah. important for sure, no doubt, because if you do not look after yourself, I mean, you will uh, uh, get down uh, the wrong the wrong way. Yeah. But selfish behavior itself is not only good for yourself, but it creates social outcomes which are beneficial to society at large. Yeah. And this is ascribed to Adam Smith. Nothing but selfish behavior is needed to arrive at a, at a good society, if you wish. Now, this is, of course, complete rubbish, because uh, Smith was very clear that um, certain purposeful actions of people may create effects they never thought about, unintended consequences okay. they never had in mind. And these unintended consequences could be either positive or neutral or negative. 
Yeah. But they could also be negative. And therefore, thinking about, I mean, the negative implications of one's own selfish actions is mm -hmm. very important. And of course, that is an issue that has to be taken up by the public authorities. Which kind of behavior has socially beneficial outcomes and which not? And this is a difficult question. Let yeah. me just uh, a bridge, uh, uh, take a bridge over to the current uh, crisis of, of, of our environment. Yeah. I mean, some of the effects of selfish actions uh -huh. show not immediately, but they build up in the course of time, they accumulate, and yes. eventually you arrive at climate crisis, you arrive at heating of the atmosphere, and so on and so forth. And what you can say is that earlier authors during the Scottish Enlightenment, Adam Smith, David Hume, and others, they were very clear that the time sequence of such outcomes has to be, to the extent to which we can do that, been taken into, into account. I mean, what are the environmental implications of what we are doing? They may turn up only in the long run, but then in the long run, they might even threaten the survival of mankind. Yes. So a selfish behavior, that's easily said. But what are the consequences immediately in the medium run, in the very long run? And nobody uh, wanted to pollute the environment, but it happened. Uh, it happened and it had uh, disastrous effects, as we see nowadays. Yes. Yes, sir. So you, you know, actually you gave, you know, some reference, which, uh, you know, point that, that there has been, you know, attempts to place economics in the image of hard sciences, right? Mm -hmm. And so, so the underlying concept of hard sciences is that it is tantamount to claiming that science is invariably cumulative in the sense that there is only progress, progress, and only progress and that there is never regress, right? But you actually make a reference where you point out that placing economics in the image of hard sciences can be counterproductive to the profession's standing. Uh, yes, sir. So why don't you, yeah, you know, give your thoughts on this, sir? Well, um, what I'm saying must not be misunderstood and not against uh, uh, keeping the stakes high. I mean, trying to uh, forge a subject uh, that is both uh, rigorous and relevant. Yeah. But uh, given the complexity of uh, the problem at hand, given the complexity and the growing complexity of our societies, um, it seems to me that we ought to be very prudent and cautious in what we are saying and what we are claiming. I mean, uh, it seems to me that some of the uh, some of the economists have have a vision of economics, which could be called um, um, a push button economics. Push button. It's it. You have a you have a machine, and for example, you want to study whether, say, some uh, increase in a tax or some uh, policy measure concerning the environment mm -hmm. is good or bad. You just um, feed it into your little machine, you push the button, and then you get the full answer of what is going to happen. That is some people's, I think, imagination. And of course, uh, if that were the case, it would be wonderful. But given the complexity of the system, we are typically, I mean, uh, uh, told that this doesn't work. I mean, uh, we do not have a model uh, a, a kind of uh, hypothetical world, which we could use uh, as an example to study the actual world, and which gives us all all uh, the correct answers. In other words, our treatment of counterfactual reasoning in economics. Yeah. What if things were different? What would happen? Yeah. Is of course, unavoidable. But at the same time, there are people who are utterly optimistic about this. And this, I think, is a problem. It's a huge problem because it gives you the impression of uh, of uh, solidity and certainty, which can't be there given uh, given the condition humaine, the 
the human condition uh, in which we live. Okay. So, sir, you are inherently, what you're saying is, uh, you know, that the contemporary economics is, you know, the foundation upon which it is built is actually much less solid than is, you know, commonly taken for granted, you know, within the profession. And so you point out that the people interested in history of economic thought often happen to be heterodox economists of various, uh, you know, uh, leanings, right? And so you, so why don't you talk about, sir, like the, like what can be the wider scope for historians of economic thought, uh, you know? Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, uh, yes, uh, I mean, uh, the questions you're raising, uh, I think are, are well taken. Um, I mean, first of all, um, the hard sciences. I mean, even the hard sciences are perhaps not as hard as one is inclined to think. Think about revolutions in physics, which have taken place. I mean, yeah. in more recent times, uh, it's already a hundred years ago, quantum yeah. physics, which changed yeah. our view of the world tremendously. And what economists typically still cling to is uh, Newtonian physics. Um, that is, they have as their, uh, their ideal uh, something that in, in the hard sciences, inverted commas, uh -huh. uh, has already to some extent been um, left behind. In, in other words, um, e economics would like to be uh, like physics, but which physics, <laughs> you know, which physics? Uh, in physics, you have, and very often it seems to me that the progress in physics is not appropriately taken up by, by economists. Uh, that is one thing. So, I mean, the entire picture of the hard sciences uh, uh, upheld by some economists is a, is a travesty of facts, I would say. Um, and secondly, uh, of course, um, uh, there is no doubt that economists had repeatedly uh, to accept that their own models are perhaps not as strong as they were inclined to think. Just think about the homo economicus, yeah. the economic man, the economic man who is capable yeah. of calculating all alternatives uh, uh, with with uh, with the power of a, a supercomputer and make uh, his or her decisions in terms of utility maximization. Yeah. yeah. Now, that, that, man is not like that. Human beings are fallible. Uh, their mental uh, dispositions play an important role. Yes. They are constrained in various uh, aspects and so, and so on and so forth. And they are not, this is important, I think, they are not just to be conceived as um, agents, as individuals confronted with goods yes. and having to choose goods. But their main problem is that consumption is typically a social act. Yes. Um, it's typically a social act. You interact with others. I mean, there's one basic misunderstanding. Once again, Adam Smith. In Adam Smith, you find uh, the famous uh, dichotomy between um, uh, water as a commodity to uh, for, against your thirst and diamonds and um, I mean the neoclassical the marginal utility theorists um, mm. understood diamonds as a good like any other good namely me and the good but not others but diamonds are typically things you like to wear yeah. in order for for others to be impressed by your riches, your wealth. So it's not you who has to see the diamond, but others. In other words, consumption is a social act and yeah. it has to be understood. We have to understand much better than we do actually. Also swarm behavior. I mean, fish, you know, fish swarms. I mean, uh, I mean, there is, there is now in, in, in the, in economics, a movement in this direction. And that means that many of the findings we have um, uh, received from past authors, for example, Martian utility theory cannot be uh, sustained. They have to give way to more deeper insights into human behavior 
and and uh, social conditions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, sir. So, so can you talk about so when you talk about you know you know placing economics in the image of hard sciences? So one of the most important foundations of hard science hard sciences is you know the way they measure data, right? So the measurement of data is completely scientific. Now in economics, uh, macroeconomics, that scientific element of you know aggregation theory and index numbers. It is found to be missing in many places, sir. I don't know whether you can talk about this, uh, Professor. Like, you know, the measurement of data that is not scientific in many cases. Well, um, I, I, I wouldn't say it's not scientific. It's, it is scientific, but the science is, is problematic. <laughs> Um, uh, let me give you an example, uh, which I think is telling. Uh, one of the uh, the workhorses, actually the workhorse in economics, is a partial equilibrium theory. Yeah, I think you're fam familiar with it. Yeah, I mean, yeah. A diagram with the demand function and the supply function, and the intersection gives you the price of the commodity yeah. and the quantity traded. Yeah, this is Marshallian. Uh, partial equilibrium analysis. Now, um, uh, is that scientific? Yes, it is, because it's accepted by a large community as uh, as being useful and informing you about important ph phenomena, namely price building and quantity uh, decisions. Now, look at it more carefully. I mean, you find it even with regard to the so-called labor market, where the price is the wage rate, and the quantity is the labor empl employed. Now, yeah. then you then you engage in counterfactual experiments. You ask yourself, what if, for example, the amount of labor in the system would be larger? You yeah. shift the supply function of labor, and the wage rate changes, but you keep the functions otherwise the same. Now, clearly enough, if the wage rate changes, a precondition of your argument is no longer um, uh, fulfilled. Now, what is that precondition? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So the Marshallian demand function. Yeah, continue, sir. You're talking about you know, the, yeah, the wage rate? Well, I mean, t t take a case in point, uh, the Marshallian partial equilibrium theory. Yeah. Uh, it is the famous diagram with uh, uh, the quantity on the x-axis and the price on the y-axis and the demand function, the supply function. And when they, when they intersect, you get the quantity traded and the price of the commodity. Now, uh, you uh, engage in counterfactual reasoning by shifting, for example, the supply or the demand function uh, without uh, informing people where that should come from. But let's assume, for example, that the supply function shifts. Then in case it shifts upwards, then of course the, uh, the price uh, of the commodity would rise and the, and the, and the quantity uh, fall. Now, it is assumed that what is happening in the market under consideration has no impact whatsoever on other markets, nor do, uh, if there were such impacts, uh, nor do such impacts fire back of our feedbacks on the former market. Now, clearly enough, this is an assumption which can hardly ever be uh, fulfilled. Think about the labor market. If the wage rate rises or falls, yeah. Then, of course, the wage rate affects also the cost structures of firms in other sectors, in other industries, and changes quantities and prices there, and so on and so forth. And if those commodities whose prices there change are inputs in the first market we are discussing, then, of course, the cost function changes. So mm -hmm. everything changes. So what can you really say? It's, it's not possible um, if you do not take into account... Um, what is being triggered by such a counterfactual change in, in one of the functions. In, in short, uh, this is a, it is science, you could say, 
but bad science because it does not take into account effects that cannot be ignored and which might change your result in your single market experiment, yeah. not only quantitatively, but qualitatively. Maybe the outcome would be not a rise in the price and a fall in the quantity, but a, ri a, a rise in the quantity and a fall in the price or, or something else. You see, there are huge problems. And if we rest our decisions on such models, I mean, you're bound to, to, to make uh, perhaps big mistakes. Yeah. So, so the thing is, uh, you, you're talking about, and this actually is a point to make in the paper also, that economics is not characterized by a smooth selection process in the yes. sense that it neither preserves all that is good, nor mm -hmm. does it eliminate all that is uh, bad. Right? Yes. And so, so you, in your paper, you know, talk about that uh, historians of economic thought could perform useful tasks in at least three respects. Right, sir. You actually, you know, point uh, this out, like three objective manners uh, that you know that historians of economic thought could, you know, uh, mm -hmm. fulfill this. So why don't you talk about you know all three of them in an objective manner, uh, sir? Mm -hmm. um, well, I mean, uh, in an earlier question, you you asked, I mean, uh, why is it uh, that uh, non-orthodox, non-mainstream economists? Uh, uh, are very often to be found amongst historians of economic thought. Well, simply because, you see, historians of economic thought, and that is one of their um, uh, services to the subject. Yeah. I mean, they, they conserve findings, insights in earlier authors, which otherwise in the subject are simply ignored. So yeah. they are, so to speak, uh, the guardians of the treasure trove of economic ideas. And it is, of course, ridiculous not to keep that treasure trove because otherwise you, are, uh, uh, you, you must reinvent uh, already known ideas time and again because you just simply forgot about them. You ignored them. So that yes. is one thing. Yes. Another yeah. thing is, of course, that you can see in the history of economic thought how certain uh, blind allies were entered and where they ended. I mean, uh, just uh, give you one example. I mean, uh, the the and very often it's perhaps not even the economists who are uh, the the originators of ideas, so the main responsibles, but the followers. Just think about. I mean, for example. Um, Marxism. I mean, Marx was a great economist. So I leave. I have no doubt about it. At the same time, uh, of course, he committed uh, huge errors. Uh, um, and uh, yet, those who made Marxism a doctrine uh, of entire countries very often um, were forced to go down uh, the wrong uh, way. And yeah. uh, this is something which I think. Uh, ought to be taken into account. And also, I mean, uh, think of Smith. Adam Smith is very often con uh, utilized in order to, to spread a, a, a neoliberal ideology. I mean, this is, again, uh, not uh, paying uh, full attention to what he actually said. He was a moral philosopher, etc. So, you see, uh, you go in, down the wrong ally. And, in the paper, and finally, in the second... So in the yeah. paper, in your second point, you actually talk about Adam Smith and that he knew that you know specialization you know comes at a price, right? Specialization of uh, labor. So you talk about this, which uh, mm -hmm. he so he vividly described the dangers of the degradation and deprivation of laboring poor, right? Yes, That's exactly. Yes. Point. Yes. Yes. yes, yeah, yes. yeah. Yes. Well, one of well, one of the one of the the arguments by Smith was that technological progress, as it was experienced at his time, was very often, uh, I mean, detrimental, at least to the conditions of the workers. For sure, it rendered uh, it rendered people who formerly were artisans and were possessed of uh, of certain uh, qualifications, high qualifications as artisans they became just appendices to machines. And as such, they were rendered, he even used the word stupid. 
Yeah. Uh, so uh, they they could not look after themselves nor after the the needs uh, and wants of the society in which they live, the cultural um, uh, 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 wants. And, and this is uh, an important thing because if you have a society in which large parts of the people are poor, illiterate, and unable to, uh, to make um, broadly correct decisions, then the entire society is, is, is in difficult, a difficult situation. And in particular, if it is a democratic society, because if people are able to vote and select their politicians, but are unable to judge their, their qualities, that's a huge problem. Right. So, I mean, some of the implications of modernity mm -hmm. um, turned out to be to be problematic. Now, clearly enough uh, to to just make uh, that footnote, the kind of technological progress Smith experienced uh, and which he was uh, inclined to uh, uh, assume to be uh, there forever uh, didn't didn't uh, doesn't hold true. I mean, we had forms of technological progress which were very much human capital based uh, rather than human capital destroying. Yes, sir. So, so you talk about, uh, you know, that, you know, like exposing itself in a democratic, uh, you know, society. So, sir, what, you know, can be done in order to, you know, correct that? like uh, division of labor, you know, becoming more and more fragmented and that sort of having, uh, you know, repercussions on, you know, the, the society, the mm -hmm. fragmentation of knowledge, that sort of, you know, having uh, repercussions mm -hmm. on society. So what can be done in a democratic setup, like in order to correct this? You think mm -hmm. the government has a role here? And if they have a role, like what you for I role think role. so. I mean, I think so. I mean, uh, and that was already clear to Adam Smith in 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 the world in which he lived. Uh, he was clear that there was the need to educate people. Public and he was educate. He was very much in favor of at least some basic education, reading, writing, uh, some mathematics, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Because if you if you do not have those capacities, how could you ever judge uh, uh, difficult questions uh, of your own and your own life and your family and those of the society at large? So, I mean, education is of great importance. At the same time, of course, education is not enough, as we know, because uh, there is the problem that given a rising complexity of society, people can come up, as we just now experience, with the, the most horrendous fake news and, and claim that this is the truth and nothing but the truth. So yeah. Um, yeah. Something, something more is needed. And I yeah. think uh, this more has to do also with, again, with uh, control and, and, uh, and uh, surveillance. I mean, uh, the social media, for example, I mean, generate and, and circulate uh, horrendous uh, stupidities. And I think uh, these stupidities may cause damage uh, to, a, to a large extent. And if that damage is caused, of course, that's bad for society. So someone must, to some extent, um, select uh, what is uh, being able to to be um, uh, distributed and whatnot. And I think if you have many people who are unable to judge properly, yeah. then of course the problem is larger than if you have many who are who are able to judge. So there is a, is a problem of knowledge and information. Uh, and uh, the state certainly has a role because private agencies typically act uh, for their own interests and their yes. own interests is typically profit oriented. Yeah. And selfish, so you cannot expect these people to uh, to do the job. I mean, Adam Smith spoke about the wretched spirit of monopoly. You see, business people are typically not interested to be um, uh, in in a, a competitive system because competition forces you to behave well, to be cost minimizer, etc. If you have a monopoly, you have a beautiful life. Nobody, I mean, really is able to to question your uh, power. Yeah. Uh, so you see, 
um, people are interested in having close followers, in having people who are addicts to their products, addictive behavior yeah. is actually created. Just think about them in sugar, uh, in, 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 in food, etc., etc. And uh, so something must be done. You must uh, look at what is being uh, done and you must uh, try to stop, I mean, what is detrimental to large parts of society. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, sir, so here it will be, you know, apt to talk about, uh, you know, Piero Sarafa. You actually mentioned about him in the in the first question, right, sir? So he actually he actually challenged the uh, the standpoint of you know the, the classical economist, you know the ideas that were built by Adam Smith and Ricardo, right? Mm -hmm. So he challenged the form in which they had been handed down, and that sort of. So he was actually trying to challenge the advent of the marginal, marginalist, you know, revolution in economics. Is that correct, mm -hmm. sir? So why don't you yeah, talk about this? Yeah, I think so. I mean, Piero Zaffa, an Italian economist um, uh, who lived in, in Cambridge uh, up until his death in 1983, he published in 1960 a book, which I think is really a great achievement in our in our subject, production of commodities by means of commodities. And when he started to uh, study economics and look carefully at alternatives, he was he was puzzled because he saw that, I mean, in Marshall, for example, who at the time was the leading author at the beginning of the 20th century, end of the uh, uh, beginning of the 20th century, end of the 19th century, um, he was the, the major author whose textbook Principles of Economics uh, was read everywhere, basically. He found out that uh, the, the portrayal of the classical authors, of early and root neoclassical authors, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, uh, being somewhat uh, um, confined to discussing production, but not so much demand, Mm -hmm. that this was in, in many respects wrong. And then he studied it more carefully and he came up with the idea that there was a fundamental break which largely went unnoticed in the discipline, namely from the classical authors on the one hand and the marginalists, as he would call them, on the other. And what is that? I mean, you see, the marginal authors, neoclassical theory, as it's called today, mm -hmm. uh, rests, I think, upon two pillars. First of all, there is Say's law, Say's law of markets. And in the classical version of it, of Say's yeah. law, it means that in a system in which uh, you have uh, sufficient uh, freedom uh, of action of agents uh -huh. and uh, owners of uh, means of production, uh, this will tend towards a situation in which all productive forces will be fully employed. And output, so to speak, will be uh, at its maximum level. Mm -hmm. So a tendency towards the full employment of labor, and there is no crisis, there is no effective demand failure because it is argued any act of saving, mm -hmm. which implies a reduction in the demand for commodities, mm -hmm. because who saves does not buy goods, is compensated by an uh, an addition of investment of equal size. And investment means you buy commodities, means of production, investment goods, etc. So there is no problem of effective demand, says law. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, the question is, how is that maximum product being distributed and the argument there goes, it is distributing according to marginal productivity theory. Uh, factors of production or the services of factors of production are paid according to their marginal product yeah. um, to, to the total output. And okay. so you have the, these twin things, uh, maximum output and at the same time, a distribution of uh, the product of income that uh, follows uh, the marginal productivity principle, and this is occasionally even, so to speak, interpreted in a in a moral way. It is good that this is the case because that is the actual 
uh, payment according to a contribution of a factor to total output. So these are the two things. Now, Safa was of the opinion that this is not, not the case. And he criticized in particular the idea that profits mm -hmm. are the margin product of capital, right? The mm -hmm. margin product of the capital. This is an assumption to be found uh, in in the in the in the neoclassical literature all over the place. So what what was his argument? Mm -hmm. His argument was the following: capital. What is capital? Capital is typically uh, uh, a huge amount of heterogeneous capital goods, mm -hmm. plows, uh, computers, etc., uh, etc. Et now, if I want to have a an idea of the quantity of capital in the system that is what all these different capital goods are in terms of a single number, mm -hmm. I can do this only by using prices to make these things commensurable, mm -hmm. comparable to one another, right? Mm -hmm. But prices, Rafa showed, depend on income distribution. That is, depend also on the rate of profits. So you, in order to, to argue about the scarcity and the mm -hmm. marginal productivity of a mm -hmm. factor like capital, you need prices, but prices depend on the rate of profits and wages and so on and so forth. So how can you um, think to be able to determine the rate of profits as the marginal product of capital? This is just not possible. Is okay. that clear? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is actually uh, clear and drives home the point that uh, you actually make in your paper. And so sir, the next point that you actually make in your paper is you talk about that, you know, much of the advances in growth theory, they yeah. are not unique in the sense that they have been actually been built upon, uh, you know, garb of ideas that have been with us for a long time. You use this, you know, word garb of ideas. So, so you actually talk about the endogenous growth model of Romer also. Uh, so, you know, like being built upon, you know, these ideas. Yeah. So why don't you talk about this? Yes, sir. Uh, the, the growth theory, yes. I mean, yes. Uh, you see, uh, for a long time, a growth theory, Solovian growth theory, neoclassical growth theory, mm -hmm. uh, started from the assumption that uh, a given technology is always uh, one that uh, shows constant returns to scale. Because this assumption was needed uh, because economists understood, neoclassical economists understood that in order to distribute the entire product without uh, an undistributed rest or uh, distributing more than there is actually, mm -hmm. required Euler's theorem. And Euler's theorem, I mean the exhaustion theorem, uh, implied constant returns to scale. But clearly enough, that was not what in Adam Smith was uh, so to speak the main the main thing in Adam Smith. We have the division of labor, and the division of labor is characterized by increasing returns to scale. So for a yeah. long time, growth theory was hooked up on a mathematical necessity of neoclassical theory, which otherwise economically made little sense because it it does not really make sense to think of doubling, say, output without changing the methods of production by means of which you produce those outputs. I mean, Smith's division of labor is clear. If you have a small village, um, division of labor is not possible because it does not make sense to become only a baker yeah. if you sell only, say, 10 breads and not more. So yeah. uh, if you change uh, the size of the market, uh, you will um, be inclined to use other methods of production, more productive ones. Yeah. So. Um, uh, you, you can see that it was only recently um, in, in, in so-called new growth theory that some of the classical ideas were picked up again, but in a way which uh, at the same time, I think, showed that uh, it, was, it was not really uh, the flavor of the classical authors, but just some a new way of uh, trying to put um, some of these ideas into a straight jacket. Um, uh, let me give you let me let me give you one example. Roma's model 
in which he had uh, assumed that uh, now capital goods are heterogeneous. I mean, he had a kind of Austrian theory of more roundaboutness in production. Mm -hmm. And as time goes by, the more roundaboutness increases. This yeah. he does by assuming that new capital goods enter the stage and are added to what is there. But actually, you see, <laughs> I mean, uh, Schumpeter spoke of creative destruction. Many of the new capital goods just wipe out old ones. You yeah. cannot start from the assumption that yeah. everything remains the same. Old capital goods are still there. Yeah. I mean, say a, a stick which was used in Babylonia yeah. in, 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 in the production of, of, of wheat is yeah. still used now. There is no, you must take into account that the entire system is revolutionized and that means that certain capital goods become obsolete. So uh, what I want to say is, in many, in many respects, modern economic theory picks up ideas that were known for centuries, but uh, is bound because of its orientation, is bound to squeeze them into a framework which turns out to be a straight jacket. Yeah. And many things can in plain words, using the verbiage uh, of the old authors, that make perfect sense without, I mean, uh, I mean, forcing you to engage in, in 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 very bizarre argumentations. Yes. Yeah, and so so one of the ideas, you know, which has been around for a long time is you know the Marxist viewpoint of the demise of capitalism, and it was. Uh, Joseph Schumpeter, who actually challenged this. And he insisted that as a method of inducing and absorbing innovations and economic change, the capitalist system, it cannot possibly run out of energy unless political measures fetter its dynamic uh, forces. Hmm. And um, so, so here I want to you know, talk about a paper which is written by Peter Betty and Paula Suarez in the year 2013. There they sort of you know talk about how the size of the government you know has been increasing as a as a percentage of uh, you know GDP. So just to give you some numbers, in the year 1870, 1870, the government spending as a percentage of GDP in the Western uh, economies was 10 percent, and mm -hmm. in the year 2009, it it stood around uh, 47, 48 percent. So, sir, given you know the quote that I have you know like uh, mentioned about you know Schumpeter's that the capitalist system cannot possibly run out of energy unless political measures fetter its dynamic forces, and so so we see that you know the size of the government is actually expanding uh, throughout the Western world. So, do you sir see this as a threatening? or a damaging trend that can actually fetter its, you know, dynamic forces, the, the rise of capitalism. Mm. Yes, sir. Well, I, well, I think uh, um, it's interesting that you brought up Schumpeter. I think Schumpeter was a most interesting author, um, very often uh, terribly misunderstood, uh, mm -hmm. but at the same time, I'm an original thinker. It is interesting that he learned most from Marx. And actually, his entire project, one could say, mm -hmm. with some um, to put Marx, so to speak, upside down mm -hmm. and to argue that uh, in uh, these enormous forces capitalism generates from within mm -hmm. uh, in terms of innovation that these uh, enormous forces were actually, for the first time, really understood by Marx. Mm -hmm. I mean, Marx's entire idea, and Engels's, of course, was that capitalism is that machine that develops um, productive forces to such an extent that eventually, mm -hmm. I mean, society would become so rich that the problem of the distribution of income yeah. would no longer be uh, a main issue uh, on the agenda. So um, capitalism was supposed to be the machine that would bring the economy out of poverty and misery. Yeah. And then socialism would be easily 
um, at, uh, attainable. I mean, maybe not easily. I mean, could be quite complicated. That was the, the basic idea. But at the same time, Marx thought, of course, capitalism would uh, have to go uh, uh, because uh, it exhausted its productive powers. And this is what Schumpeter criticized. Now, you can't say on the one hand, this machine is so good. And on the other side, you say, but at the same time, the machine is the source of uh, the transition from capitalism to socialism. And he accused Marx of basically confounding, you could say, the downturn part of a Kondratiev. Are you familiar with the Kondratiev concept? No, sir. No. No. I mean, uh, there, there was the idea by Russian economists uh, at the beginning of the 20th century uh, that uh, economic development would occur in long-term cycles. I mean, innovations would need time to get into the system, they would then exhaust and the new wave of innovations would come. So Kondratiev's, according to Schumpeter, a cycles, growth cycles of uh, 50 years length. Mm -hmm. And uh, what, what Schumpeter argued against Marx was, you, you take the downward uh, part of the cycle in a Kondratiev, a long uh, term cycle, as so to speak, the whole story. But after a downward, there will be an upward again. So the shum the the system will not run out of um, steam because creativity of, of people will be there, and they will be confronted with new situations that require new answers, and so on and so forth. Um, he was strongly against an increase. In, in 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 the in, in state activities he was strongly uh, critical of Keynes mm -hmm. but I think in some respects uh, he was quite wrong he did not understand that there was a problem of effectual demand which Keynes had pointed out okay. according to Schumpeter there is no such thing as a problem of effectual demand there may be crisis but the system is self-healing is capable of overcoming the crisis. But one may ask Schumpeter critically, if new technologies mm -hmm. are of a of a of a size that uh, I mean the implications in the short and medium run of perhaps huge unemployment um, endanger uh, the legitimacy of the system as a whole and threaten mm -hmm. the system as a whole, mm -hmm. you must do something about it, don't you? Mm -hmm. And clearly enough, we are currently perhaps facing again such a situation with artificial intelligence and all that. Mm -hmm. I mean, artificial intelligence, uh, to look at it uh, from an extreme perspective, implies that one day it should be possible that machinery is doing all the work. Yeah, Machines produce themselves, they produce goods, but mm -hmm. who then is able to consume who is not the proprietor of a mm -hmm. machine? Yeah. So the distribution problem is huge and the employment problem is huge. And this was already anticipated, for example, by Ricardo actually pointed out that what will be the same situation if there is full automation in 1821. Okay. So um, Schumpeter, I think, was not was not uh, able to really destroy these kind of arguments. Uh, and uh, nevertheless, I mean, he had very interesting things to say. Okay. So, sir, you know, given that, uh, you know, the second welfare theory of eco economics where, you know, the distribution of resources is, is something which is like a big problem. So, sir, in your opinion, do you think that that would actually call for, you know, revaluation of the role of the government in a, in a society of free, you know, individuals? Given that automation and you know all this, yeah, thing. well, yeah. Well, I think I think uh, when you look at the uh, um, theory of finance and uh, I mean uh, the economics of governments and uh, governments and governance, then of course we can say there are essentially uh, three uh, three problems to be to be tackled. Uh, first of all, there's the problem of the allocation of resources. Governments must put forward incentive structures such that there is no waste of uh, scarce resources. Yeah. And um, 
but they are led into the right channels. So that is easily said, uh, but more difficult if you if you discuss uh, uh, concrete uh, uh, examples. But uh, you ought to take that into account, and you will come up with, uh, I'm sure, arguments that uh, help you in this regard. Secondly, there is of course uh, the problem of, um, I think, income distribution and justice. I mean, the government ought to make sure that uh, the inequality amongst people yeah. is not getting out of uh, uh, control. I mean, if you have um, a very small a group of super rich yeah. and a growing number of poor, yeah. this is not good for the survival and uh, the quality of the society under, under consideration. And therefore, you ought to be uh, clear that something has to be done. Let me just add one aspect. I mean, we all uh, uh, are very fond of innovators, people right. who are successful yeah. in coming up with new ideas and making loads of money. Yeah. Uh, and typically, we typically argue that, um, I mean, uh, people should be uh, considered accountable for what they are doing. Yeah. Now, what are is doing on the one hand innovations and bettering our living conditions if the innovations are any good but on the other hand innovations as Schumpeter said once again yeah. imply creative destruction they they destroy the old and therefore one has to make innovators responsible not only for the good and the yeah. profits they make, but also for the bad yeah. the loss jobs etc etc they must contribute so to speak to uh, to 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 cover those uh, costs uh, societal costs yeah. this is not typically done but it ought to be uh, babbage one of the early uh, economists and uh, uh, engineers he argued that indeed innovators are not only to benefit from the from the uh, novelty but yeah. they should also uh, contribute to somehow uh, looking after those who, who go into misery. And finally, of course, um, of course, there is the problem of uh, effective demand failures um, and uh, effective demand policy. Uh, I think um, in, in, a, in a Keynesian way, that uh, is, 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 is good. And uh, quite often it implies that indeed you must have um, state activities in this regard and um, looking after the common good. I mean, we should take into account the fact that there are many things which are not private goods, but common and cultural goods. Yes. And they must be looked after. And they will not typically be looked after uh, by private individuals, but there must be institutions well run, of course. I'm not yeah. arguing in favor of waste and all that, Yeah. Uh, but that's important. Yeah, so, so of course, yeah. One, one, one. If I may add that one, one case in point is, of course, uh, defense of a country. Yeah. You see, Adam Smith pointed out that the process of civilization brings about a society that is hedonistic, where people only look after their well-being and interested in money. Yeah. Now, if, if you have such a society, nobody wants to defend your country. Yeah. That is currently the case in the Ukraine. Yeah. where the Russian Federation attacks a country, uh, well, and Putin apparently was of the opinion that the West would not respond to it because they are hedonistic and only caring for their own money. Yeah. So, well, okay. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. So, sir, I just, one point that I have in mind, which is like a final, you know, point. So, given all those, you know, points that you have, you know, talked about, about the allocation and you know, the government playing a role in uh, addressing the inequality. But do you think, sir, over the course of the last 50 years, the, the Chinese Communist Party, they have sort of, you know, fulfilled all those uh, criteria fairly well, uh, the, the, the system of communism in China. And, and uh, like, there is something that, you know, we can learn from, you know, how they have managed to bring up so many millions of people out of poverty. Any thoughts there, sir? Yes, I mean, I think that is indeed uh, a, a remarkable achievement um, of, of China. 
uh, to indeed bring people out of poverty uh, and uh, enter uh, a path uh, of growth and uh, and uh, well-being. Well, uh, well, uh, well-being that is indeed amazing. At the same time, of course, you can see that. Uh, there are problems um, in, in, the, in the Chinese economy. I mean, on the one hand, of course, uh, this is a historical experience we, we um, saw time and again, that uh, less developed countries do have up to a point the advantage of being able to yeah. imitate the uh, developed ones, and then your development path is just a part of imitation. Yeah. But once you reach, so to speak, uh, yes. uh, uh, the the roof of that uh, uh, potential, then mm -hmm. you must turn into an innovating uh, society, and that is more difficult. Yeah. Um, at the same time, uh, I wonder whether an economic system that is so much uh, uh, concentrated on the power of a single person, that is Xi Jinping, yeah, is in the long run uh, not uh, in danger of uh, really, I mean, uh, being. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, yes, professor. Okay, uh, I mean, uh, putting all your eggs in a single basket. Yes, is problematic. This is not risk averse, <laughs> and I think if you put. Uh, all power in a single hand, yes. as it is the case in China, yeah. uh, I find this worrisome because uh, if that uh, person that has all the power mm -hmm. is a good person, a philosopher, uh, a king of yeah. proper quality, yeah. you might be lucky. But uh, if it is otherwise, it might be disastrous. I mean, in other words, I think Adam Smith was quite right in um, being frightened of too much of a concentration of power in the hands of a few. He was yeah. very much opposed to this yeah. and thought that uh, a society could only uh, uh, work beneficially for, for its members if the power is spread out. Um, I mean, there, need, there must be some power to, to, to arrive at decisions and there must be a mechanism by means of which political decisions are taken, but it is always wrong, I think, to um, accumulate too much power in single hands. So I think that's a huge problem. And if I look at the uh, party meetings in, in, in Beijing, I'm, <laughs> I'm inclined to be a bit frightened, I must say. Okay. So, uh, sir, given India system is, you know, completely at odds with, you know, the, the political system in China, right? Mm -hmm. We are democratic, uh, you know, uh, country where um, elections are going to happen every five years. And then, so, sir, do you think that that system where the democratic institution sort of complements better capital, I mean, it it does a better job at complementing capitalism, free market economy, or do you think that this is a system that the Chinese employed was that is that better at complementing you know capitalist uh, you know society? Uh, mm. Well, I think you see uh, in a, in a Schumpeterian manner, I would answer. It always depends in which situation you are. Apparently the kind of uh, government uh, and institutions that Chinese uh, have got uh, did quite well uh, up until now. But what will be the situation now? Uh, it seems they are facing a, a major crisis and uh, it is not clear to me that they will get out of it easily. Uh, they might end up in a, in a situation in which we have reached a certain level of income per capita, mm -hmm. but then uh, growth, uh, I mean, will might falter. Uh, it need not be the case, but it might. And um, it seems to me that certain decisions that have taken more, more recently mm -hmm. um, are not, 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 not all that good, that the huge construction sector is crashing. Yeah. It has um, vast implications for the rest of the economy. Yeah. Uh, is, is a very bad sign. So what I'm saying is, 
that basically for, for the question of power and concentration of power, democracy is in principle a good thing, but I would not be overly optimistic because of fake news and the fact that many people are easily um, to be fascinated by wrong ideas. So uh, should yeah. it already pointed that out, you see, I mean, uh, not all people are really capable of, uh, of, of taking proper decisions, but uh, democracy is still, uh, I think, the best way we can uh, cope with uh, uh, the problems confronting a complex and ever more complex society. The question is how the networks amongst those different, different peoples are um, fabricated and whether they can cope even with uh, a stormy winds and, uh, and, and huge problems. And uh, I think on the whole, uh, that uh, democracy is, is is not such a bad form. In some in some uh, situations, however, it's clear enough. Um, uh, a more concentrated power is 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 uh, is uh, preferable, but it depends upon circumstances. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, sir. So, any last words around the Indian economy? And you know, like we are sort of a service, you know, export of services, you know. That is actually the main hallmark of our, you know, growth uh, in the case of India. Any words, any last thoughts there, Professor, on, on the Indian economy, given your, you know, knowledge of the economic history, uh, you know, there, Professor? Well, I think, uh, I mean, India is, is, is doing... Uh... Uh, admirably well in terms of economic development. Uh, your 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 growth performance in in recent years has been has been uh, amazing. And uh, what is also the fact apparently, just think about uh, technological progress and the diffusion of novelty in in the system. It is it is it is remarkable, no doubt. At the same time, of course, um, as we when we when we exchanged. Uh, let us uh, some time ago think about uh, India's success uh, yeah. flying to the moon. Yeah. To the moon. You, you were very proud of it, and, and <laughs> rightly so. Yeah. But at the same time, I told you where there is where there is light, there is also shadow. Yes. So don't get don't get carried away. India is coping with huge problems. Yes. yes. Uh, that have not gone away by uh, good growth uh, figures. Yes. And I think these problems ought to be taken seriously in some civilized way or to be found to cope with them. Yeah. Um, I think I need not go into details here, but um, I'm, I'm quite optimistic that you can manage. But once again, I mean, education, 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 and try to have a society in which uh, the power of some is constrained by the many. Yes. And that only education can make that happen. And by education, you mean education, which is like a proper informed mind rather than a yes, yes, half informed, yes. half informed, you know, uh, mind. Yes, 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 yes. Look at the problem yes, in its yes. entirety. Yeah, thank you so and much. What, yeah, and what is very important, let me just uh, say that you and the history of economic thought, which uh, the entire the entire interview we had was about it. I am uh, convinced that you ought to be exposed to alternative but serious views. Yes. So if only one view to know on is not good enough, yes. I mean, your, your uh, so to speak, creativity yes. must be fueled by being exposed to alternative views that give you a choice. Because, you see, uh, evolution, yes. development, presupposes choice. Yes. And this presupposes alternatives. Yes. So that would be the thing uh, politically, economically, and culturally. Yeah, and that's where you know you your humility also comes into the picture because you cannot sit back and say, I know everything. Because people in the past no, no, they no. have they, they knew more than you, right? So that's why humility mm. also comes into the picture, right? Because yeah. being able to learn also is like a big is a big step in you know learning. Or unlearn whatever that you have learned. Yeah, thank you so much, sir. On that note, thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. It was a pleasure. Yeah, you delight. I wish you. I wish you all the best. Yeah, such a delight. Yeah.
Let yes. me know what is going to happen with the podcast. Podcast. You might send me perhaps a yes, uh, yes. A yeah. yes okay. I will send you the link. I will send you the link. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you so much. Very nice. Bye bye. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Bye. Bye. Bye, sir. Thank you.